Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. Well, good morning. So I'm Joel. I'm the teaching guy here, and we're going to continue our series today called Name Dropper. Uh, Name Dropper, if you don't have a name dropper in your life, that's somebody who uses somebody else's name to get access to something they wouldn't be able to get on their own. They say, oh yeah, I know Joe. And they're like, oh, well, any friend of Joe is a friend of mine. I'll give you that discount, right? A name dropper is somebody who uses somebody else's name. And the cool thing about God is he says, look, I go by a lot of names because as that verse says in Colossians, man, he is in everything and he is over everything. And he says, hey, call on my name and you'll be saved. So we've been looking at the different names and the different characteristics of who God is. It started out to be a four-week series, and Pastor Marcus and I liked it so much, we're like, let's just expand it. So I think we're in week seven this week of Name Dropper, and we're going to be talking today about God as the Alpha and the Omega. Now, Alpha means the beginning, and Omega means the end. And I know a lot of us, we like beginnings. It's fun, it's exciting, thrilling, but a lot of us, we look at endings as a failure or something bad. But I'm convinced that God is in not just the beginnings, he's also in the endings. Real quick, I uh, want to make an announcement. We've got our youth that this, this uh, year, they're going to be going to Honduras. And so we have a fundraiser going for them. On the way out, make sure you grab some cookies, tacos, whatever it is, or just throw some money in the plate if you want out there under the pavilion. So we're, gonna, we're trying to fund all of our kids going on the mission trip to Honduras this year. So, uh, man, there is nothing like a mission trip to change your perspective on life. So we're hoping to have that for all of our youth. So that, that's going on out there. Uh, but let's jump into this. So I got a question. When I'm, doing, uh, when I'm doing counseling, I've been doing, for the last 12, probably 12, 15 years, I've been doing leadership counseling. And when I try and help people figure out kind of what, what they want to be when they grow up, it's funny, I, I work with a lot of guys in their 50s that say, I still don't know what I want to be when I grow up. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. somebody up in the front row here recognizes it. Um, I'm kind of that way. I'm like, what do I want to be when I grow up? I guess, I guess this is what I'm going to be doing. I'm doomed to be a pastor. So, just kidding. <laughs> I ask people, I say, I want you to think back to a time in your life when things were just like, there was a, like a moment or a season where things were just perfect. Like it was just idyllic, like perfect, the perfect moment, right? For some people, it's like, oh man, the perfect moment was back in those days when my kids couldn't talk back to me. Those were the days, man, when they, when I, they just did what I, they were told and I was God to them. Those were the days, right? Some people, maybe it was a vacation they took and they say the weather was perfect, every, the climate was perfect, everything was perfect. And I say, look, as you look back at what you identify as the perfect, it kind of helps you identify some of your motivations and, and the drives that you have within you as you're seeking to move forward. So let's do something really quick. I'm not gonna charge you for this. This is free, all right? But everybody close your eyes for just a second and think back to what is, when, when things get stressful in life, when things get challenging, what's that perfect moment or maybe season or maybe time of life that you go back to and go, ah, that was perfect. You got it? Anybody struggling? Anybody struggling? Now, I don't think most of us struggle because most of us have an idea in our mind of, ah, that was the perfect moment, right? We've all got these perfect moments in our life. For me, it was a time right after I got out of college, I started leading backpacking teams around the world. And we did this one trip where we flew into Hong Kong and then we worked our way up through China. We smuggled Bibles into China. That was super fun. Um, worked, worked our way up through China, went up into Northern Mongolia, rode, lived, stayed in a yurt up there and rode horses. Then we went down through Western China up to Mount Everest in the Himalayas then came back through Hong Kong and flew to this little island called Saipan. And Saipan is, is right in the middle of the South Pacific. It's actually a, a U.S. commonwealth. It's the only U.S. commonwealth where it means we have this relationship with them where you can go there on a U.S. passport and we have economic agreements with them. And uh, it's in the Marianas Islands. So there's these three islands, Saipan, Tinian, and Rota. Tinian is actually the island that they flew the, uh, the, the the atomic bomb that bombed Hiroshima, they flew it from there. So it's kind of close to Japan. And we stayed in this beautiful area in Saipan on this green cliff overlooking the Pacific Ocean. And I just remember sometimes when life gets stressful, my mind goes back to that perfect time. I was like, that was the perfect week. There was no responsibility, no kids. Everything was perfect. Everything was good. Life was just perfect then. Now, in psychology, we talk about something called rosy retrospection, which is the tendency to look back at what used to be and only remember the good and forget about the bad. We filter out the bad. So if I look back at that, I really actually realized, actually, I was broke, alone, and angst-riddled the whole time. But 
in my mind, oh, that was perfect. And we've all got seasons like that. Maybe for some of you as a, as a time frame where you go, man, I just remember in college, I had such a good community of friends around me. And I talk to so many adults, they say, it's really hard to make friends after college or high school. Have you noticed that? It's just really hard to make friends. And the people you end up having to make friends with are the people that are the, kid, the parents of your kids' friends because you're always ending up together at soccer or, or football or school. Anybody relate to that? Yeah, and so you're like, well, they're good enough. I guess they're our friends. But, uh, right, some of you men relate to that. You're like, oh, we got to hang out with them again. And your wife's like, act like you like it. So am I making anybody? Okay, anyway, I want to ask if you relate to this. This is my reality, man. So anyway. Just kidding. It's hard. And some of us look back and go, man, those days of college, it was so easy. We we're just sitting around in the dorm room, lighting our farts on fire. It was so fun. It was just great. You know, and you're like, I talked to men. They're like, I just wish I could get back to that. And you're like, guy, grow up, grow up. And, it's like, and a lot of us, we just, we look back at life and we go, man, I really miss those days. Anybody relate to that? You got a season of life. He goes, perfect. My wife and I were talking about a season where uh, we lived right, it was right after we got married, the church that I was associate pastor at gave us a house right behind the church. And man, it was awesome. Except it wasn't awesome. Because it wasn't awesome because we were right behind the church. So anytime anybody needed anything, they'd knock on the door, Pastor Joel. I'm like, ah, now y'all know why I hate being called Pastor Joel. It rings back to being knocked on the door at two in the morning. Be like, Pastor Joel, I need your help. Everybody knew where we lived. But the cool thing about it was as soon as church was over, everybody would come over to our house. We had one, one weekend where we had all these Africans that were at our, our church. And I said, can you guys make some African food for us? And they're like, we'd love to. So they went and got food and they cooked. And we had all these people at our tiny little two-bedroom, one-bad house pouring out of the world. And we had this big party of African food. It was great, except when it wasn't great. But all I remember is the great. And you look back and we go, man, I wonder if we'll ever recover that when things were so much easier. We could stay up as late as we want. Now we're like, gosh, we've got to go to bed because our kids got to get to school at 7 a.m. And so you're like, man, get the kid in bed by 7.30 so we can have some peace and quiet. Anybody relate to that? You're just like, just get the kids in bed and we'll be okay. That's life now. And you look back and you go, man, uh, I miss those days. And so many of us, we look at the days that came to an end, and we go, ah, oh, I really miss those days. But there's this verse that I love where God talks about the fact that he's not only in the start of something, he's in the end of something. And the, the verse actually comes at the very, very, very end of the Bible. This is the last chapter in the Bible. It's in the book of Revelation. Now, most of the, most languages call the book of Revelation the book of the apocalypse, the apocalypse, and we think of apocalypse as like fire raining down from heaven. But you know that what apocalypse, the Greek word, it actually means the unveiling. It means you just take the veil and you pull it away and go, oh, that's what was hiding behind there. And that's what the book of Revelation is. It's, it's, it's John's revelation or the apocalypse where he goes, oh, that's what's going on behind there. And the crazy thing is what he saw going on behind the scenes was so mind boggling. He couldn't even explain it really well. So he's talking about things with 100 eyes and 37 wings. And you're like, what does that even mean? And we try and describe it. And you're like, well, that's not even beautiful. And he's like, it was so beautiful. It had 37 wings and 100 eyes. And we're like, that looks like a spider to me. Like, he's trying to explain things that are so foreign to his mind that when he unveils, he's like, whoa, what is this? And as he tries to put words to it, he can't put words to it. And we end up with the book of Revelation. And people all the time try and tell you what Revelation means. Listen, anybody that tells you they've got the corner on what the book of Revelation means, Hey, don't, don't listen to them. There's so much mystery in the book of Revelation. And it's one of those things that when we get to the end and we look back and we'll be able to see with the perfect eyes that God has given us, we'll go, oh, that's what that meant. But for now, as we're reading Revelation, we're like, what in the world does this even mean? And this is where Jesus shows up and he says this. I love the start of this chapter. It says this. It says, the end, it's Eden restored. It's the m moment that we're going to return to when things truly were idyllic and perfect. You go, man, those were the days when there was no sin. There was a tree of life. Man, it was all there. So it says this. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the trees are for the healing of the nations. I don't even pretend to know what that means. It's beautiful. What is the healing of the nations? Not sure. 
What does the 12 symbolize there? Oh, there's all sorts of conjecture about what it symbolizes. The bottom line is when John unveils it, he's like, here's what I'm seeing, and I don't quite understand what's going on here. But he continues. He says, no longer will there be any curse. Literally, everything will be solved. It will be perfect. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. And then Jesus shows up, and he says, look, I'm coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to each person according to what they have done. I will reward them. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. I'm the beginning and the end. Now, he's talking to a Greek audience, and they knew what Alpha and Omega meant. Alpha and Omega is the starting letter of the alphabet, A, Alpha, and Z, what they call Omega, or as some Canadians call it, Z. You know, we're the only ones that call it Z. Canadians and Brits, they call it Z. He says, I'm the A to Z. Yeah, it is kind of wacky. I don't know where they learned English, those English people. Anyway, I'm the beginning. He's basically saying, anything you can spell, <laughs> I'm, I'm it. Like, it starts from me and it ends with me. I'm the beginning and the end. And what's really fascinating is this, this image has been used throughout history with things like this. You, maybe you've seen this logo before. You go, what, what does this mean? This is an ancient Christian logo for Christianity. And it uses alpha and omega. But right in the middle of the beginning and the end, it uses this symbol, which is the chi, which is the X. Or it has the K sound, k. And then the rho, the P, anytime you see P in Greek, is rho. It's an R sound. Christ, Christo. Right in the middle of the beginning and the end, Christ is right in the middle of that. And that's what the early Christians were reckon, reckon, uh, recognizing with the chi and the rho. Really interesting little nerd moment here. Um, I think it's interesting. People don't think it's interesting, but I think it's interesting, so you're about to hear about it. Okay, a couple years ago, I went to the Archivos de India, which is the place where they store all of the archives and all of the records from the Spanish exploration of the Americas. There's a letter in there handwritten by Christopher Columbus on display. And what's fascinating is the way he signs his name is he puts XP, this symbol, Cristo, and then his last name is Ferens, F-E-R-E-N-S, which means bearer of. Cristo Ferens, bearer of Christ. He saw himself in that way. It's a fascinating way that his job was to be a bearer of Christ. Isn't that interesting? No. Okay, we'll move along. <laughs> so right in the middle of the beginning and the end is Christ. Now, I know that for most of us, we love beginnings, which is why we love weddings. Weddings are such a beautiful uh, beginning of a love, of a relationship of love. Isn't that, aren't weddings amazing? We spend thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars on weddings, and we're like, ah, oh, weddings are so beautiful. It's such a wonderful thing, and we, we rejoice and we celebrate them. In fact, Emily, we oftentimes get people asking for our Airbnb. They're like, we're going to come to your Airbnb for a honeymoon, and Emily's like, can we give them a discount? <laughs> Problem is, I'm not really impressed with weddings. You know what I'm impressed with? I'm impressed with 50-year anniversaries. Anybody can get married, literally now, married dog if you want. Anybody can get married, legally, I don't know, under God, I don't think that counts. It doesn't count for sure, but everybody's like, oh, anything counts. Look, anybody can get married. The question is, can you stick with it for a really, really long time? Because if you've been married a while, you know marriage ain't easy. And when you see somebody that's stuck it out for 50, 60 years and they still love each other, you go, oh. That's impressive. Let me give you a discount. <laughs> right? That's impressive because we know how hard that is. And I, I think that's where King Solomon, he's saying, look, he says, this is one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible. He says, the end of a matter is better than its beginning and patience is better than pride. You know, the beautiful thing about an ending is you actually get to see how things turned out. You get to see what things were really like, which is why I, I kind of like funerals. But I've been to a few funerals where People had to lie about the person that was laying in the casket. And I'm listening to this, and I'm like, did we know the same person? Like, I don't, I know you're not supposed to speak ill of the dead, but I don't think it says it's okay to lie about the dead. But how many people are going, man, they just did not get it right. They were selfish and egotistical their whole life. They didn't care about anybody. And we're all like, oh, they were just such loving people. And you're like, no. The end tells the story. It's the unveiling. And you go, oh, snap. 
Well, that's where the end is so powerful. And I love that, that, that God says this. He says, I'm not only in the beginnings. I'm in the endings. And the really powerful thing about this, we see endings as failures. But I love something Seneca said. He says, every new beginning comes from some other beginning's end. Seneca was a Stoic philosopher. He lived almost the same time as Jesus. And some of you go, oh, wait, I thought that was semi-sonic that's saying that. Closing time. Every new beginning comes from some other beginning. Y'all remember that? Anybody 40? You remember that? It was all over KISS, K-I-S-S. Sorry to admit that, but I used to listen to it. They didn't come up with that. Seneca said it. And it's this idea that for something new to begin, there often has to be something that ends. And we look at endings oftentimes as failure. I remember one time we had to close a ministry in Mexico. And I remember I felt like such a failure because in, it, we see success as you build something, you slap a, a plaque with your name on it, and then it outlives you forever. But you know, God says he's the beginning and the end. There are some things that should end. Only the government creates programs that don't end. Some things are way past their due date, and we still elect them. I mean, sorry, some things are way past their due date, and we hang on to them. We hang on to them, and we go, oh, it's, at least we stick with what's familiar. That's just a human nature thing, because, because to end something feels like, oh, but what's going to come next? Right? It's better to go with what we know, and I'm not, I'm not talking politically. I know I shifted y'all mind politically. I'm talking about in general, this is our life pattern. We hold on to things, and oftentimes we go, man, that, that friendship oh, would be so great if they were still a friend, but why did it have to end that way? And oftentimes we don't realize that oftentimes God will move, remove people from our lives because they were holding us back from what we needed to grow forward into who he had us to be. And growth is what it's all about. In fact, I'm convinced that God himself is constantly growing. God, we think of God as like, here's God. No, listen, I'm convinced that God is, some, is, is this being who is constantly getting bigger and bigger and bigger. You know, the universe is expanding, they say. There's no doubt about that. I believe that God is at the source of that expansion. He is constantly expanding. And as we walk with him, he's calling us to constantly expand and grow and become more and more and more. In fact, there's this verse uh, there's this verse in uh, Corinthians. It's, I think it's 2 Corinthians. It's a weird one. It says, Christ's love compels us. And that word compels, that Greek word syneko, it means, it's a weird word because it means to squeeze and push. And you go, how do you squeeze and push? Well, here's how you squeeze and push, like a tube of toothpaste. You squeeze and you push. And that's what God says. He's like, I'm going to come around you and I'm going to show you my love. And my love is going to show you you can be way more than you are. And you feel this push and you're like, ah, oh, ah, oh, man, I just wanted to stay in the tube, right? It's kind of like being born. Like, I just wanted to stay in there. It was all nice and safe. <laughs> he said, no, Christ's love comes in and he pushes you out to become all you are. And, and, but here's what I'm convinced. I believe that the growth that we experience, it doesn't look like this, a straight line. I believe it looks like this, an ever-expanding circle. Or, yea, a spiral. In fact, in Psalm 23, it says, The Lord is my shepherd. He leads me in paths of righteousness. That Hebrew word path, magol, it means paths made of circles. And what I, I'm convinced that means is that God's work in our life isn't a straight line. It actually looks something more like this. Where in every season, there's a beginning of a season and there's an end of a season. But the season, just when you think it's the end, he actually says, no, this is actually just the beginning because every new beginning comes from some other beginning's end. A season's ending and you're going, why did it have to end? And he goes, because it's not ending. You're building on it. And that's the important thing to understand. In the Christian faith, we don't end something and then push it out of the way. If we're ever growing, we transcend the, the season and then we include it into our story. You transcend, you get a realization about God, and you include that, but you say, that's not enough. I need to know more, God. I need to know Christ. I want to know, that's what Paul says. I want to know Christ and his sufferings. That's what he's talking about. I want to keep expanding in that. And I'm convinced in every season of life, God's work looks something like this. Now, I'm going to blow through this. I wrote a whole book about it. It's called Connecting the Dots. It's available in the back if you want it. There's also a YouVersion devotional about it that's for free online on the YouVersion Bible app. But every season starts with a turning point. A moment happens where everything changes. 
Maybe you experience, you, you move to a new city or maybe a, a child is born or maybe it's the death of a loved one or a divorce. Sometimes it's stuff we expected. Sometimes it's stuff we didn't expect, but it's this beginning. It's an alpha, an alpha where something new starts. And when, when something new happens, it always requires courage. Courage is required because look, it's the unknown. When you go into a new season, it's always unknown. That's why we hate endings because what we knew ends and we have to go into something unknown. And here's one thing I've learned about courage. Look, fear never goes away. You'll never be fearless but you can fear less. And the only way that fears goes away is when you turn and face the thing you fear and you slowly move towards it. And as you slowly move towards it, the dragon gets smaller and you go, wow, this is, I still feel afraid, but I'm moving forward in spite of it. And then a guide shows up and in our life, the guide is the Holy Spirit. And he says, look, I'm gonna guide you into truth in this new season. I'm gonna show you how to live out who I say you can be in this new season. If you think about this, this is every epic story we ever love. Luke Skywalker, minding his own business, comes across Obi-Wan Kenobi, Frodo Baggins, minding his own business. Gandalf shows up, I need you to destroy this ring. And we set out on this journey, and these, these stories resonate with us because they're a picture of God's work in our lives. And a moment comes where the hero, or you, <laughs> who's the hero? Actually, God's the hero. It's his story you're living in, but you get to live it out. You have to make a decision. You have to go all in. The hero has to decide, hey, I've been swinging on this vine over here. It got me this far. But to keep my forward movement, I have to release the vine that I know, end this journey here, and start on a new journey to keep your forward movement. If you hang on to this one and the new one that hadn't been tested just to make sure it's safe, you're going to stop moving forward. You're going to be dangling like a fool in the jungle. You have to let go, and you have to grab the new one that hadn't been tested. And you go all in on the season. And here's what I've found. When you commit to the path, the way will open to you. I know that sounds super zen. But a lot of people say, well, I just need to know the way forward before I move forward. I say, it doesn't work that way. God says his word is a lamp into your feet and a light into your path. He doesn't say it's a floodlight on all of the path. He says, you just take one step at a time and trust that my word and my truth and the Holy Spirit is going to guide you. You take one step and you go, "Woo, it's still really dark. And you, but okay, we made it here. Ooh, it's still dark. And, and you, eventually you look back and you go, wow, look how far we came through the darkness, just trusting God to lead us step by step. But it was because we went all in and then the path became clear to us. As the path goes on, you face a series of adventures, a.k.a. challenges. G.K. Chesterton, he's my favorite author, he says, an adventure is only an inconvenience rightly considered. It's not an adventure until something goes wrong. And when things hit the fan and you go, whoa, this is hard, God starts pulling things out of you, bad things you want to get rid of, and good things you didn't even know were in you. And you go, I didn't even know I had this capability. One of my favorite psalms is, if you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. And my wife, Emily's like, I don't really know if that's a very encouraging verse. I'm like, I think it's encouraging because what it means is if you're still standing and it's really hard, you're way stronger than you think you are because God's power is living in you. If you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small, but if you're still standing, you're way stronger than you think because it's God's power giving you the power. You face these challenges and eventually you come to a dark cave where you have to enter the dark cave empty-handed and alone. You feel vulnerable, feel like maybe... You're all alone. Maybe you even feel like God's abandoned you. He's gotten really quiet. But listen, when a teacher knows it's time for you to pass the test, they sit across the room and they don't give you the answers. And you go, teacher, teacher, no, 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 no. Shh. Prove to me you've internalized what I've been teaching you along this journey. And the teacher gets really quiet. And, and, and I often say, what if God's silence is actually a sign of his confidence in your ability to pass the test? And you enter this cave and you fight this battle with whatever it is. And usually you emerge with a wound, a hip, you're walking with a limp, slice in your side, feeling like maybe half the person you used to be, a little less of what you used to be. And then God says, sweet, now I'm ready to use you. And you'll be, yeah, but God, I'm half the person I used to be. And he's like, yeah, but now you're not depending on your own strength. You're depending on my strength. A.W. Tozer says, it's doubtful whether God can use a person greatly before he's first wounded them deeply. You go, I don't like that. But that's how Paul can say something like, I rejoice in my suffering. I know that suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character and character produces hope. And hope doesn't put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. And then we come to my favorite part of the book to write, which is what I call the resolution or the end of the season. There's a resolution where you step out of the cave and maybe nothing has changed, but everything's changed because external change is always preceded by internal change. 
Things may not change around you, but if you change what's going on inside of you, you've already got the victory. You say, man, it's still chaos around me, but I've got the peace inside of me because I have confidence in God in me. And internal change precedes external change. And there's this resolution moment where you go, whoa. And you get a new perspective. You begin to see God from a new angle. You begin to see yourself from a new angle. And then you emerge with a message and a mission. And this is where I think it's beautiful because God likes to use every season to give us a greater message of his glory in our lives. And a person with experience is never at the mercy of a person with a theory. And when you've lived through a season and it comes to an end, and you go, wow, and you look back and you see that maybe God was not only in the alpha, he was also in the omega. He was from the beginning to the end of it, right in the middle of it, Christ was living right through that whole situation in your life, growing you into more of who you could be. And eventually that season comes to an end and there's a new turning point. And you do the whole thing again, but every time you're growing out and you're becoming more and more understanding of who God is, even though you'll never tap the fullness of who he is because he's constantly getting bigger. But you grow and you get stronger and you go, wow, okay. And with that, armed with that knowledge, you don't have to be afraid of endings. In fact, you come to look forward to the ending because you go, man, at the end, it's going to be unveiled and we're going to see what was really going on here. And I'm not afraid of endings. Yeah, I wish it wouldn't have ended that way, but I'm not going to be afraid of it. And that's where Paul says this. I love this verse. He says, therefore, don't pronounce judgment before the time. How many of us, when life happens in our life, we go, stuff happens in our life, we go, oh, this is really bad, or oh, this is really good. But as you look back further, you start to realize those things that were really bad, you go, wow, actually, that actually turned out really good. And you look back and go, that completely sucked. Don't ever want to do that again. <laughs> but I would never have become what I am today had I not gone through that. So in a weird way, I thank God that he allowed me to go through that and walked with it, me through it. That's what he says. Paul says, don't judge the situation yet before the Lord comes. He'll bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. At the unveiling, you'll get to see what was really going on. And it says, and then each one will receive his commendation from God right back to what Jesus says in Revelation. I'm coming. I'm gonna make everything clear and I'm gonna reward you based on your faithfulness in it. And sometimes we look back at endings, we go, oh, that was very, very no good, bad. But I believe armed with this knowledge and realization of who God is, you can see that, man, not only is he in the beautiful beginnings, he's in the endings, whether the ending was ugly. And listen, if the ending was ugly, Seek reconciliation if you can. Paul says this. He says, as best as it's possible, live at peace with everyone. Basically, it's re recognizing there are some people that you're going to seek reconciliation with and they're going to want nothing to do with it. But if you go to them and you seek reconciliation, say, man, I wish it wouldn't have ended this way. And they say, I don't want anything to do with you. At least your heart is pure. Because remember, external transformation starts with internal transformation. And you go, man, it, it, I didn't like the way this ended. I wish it wouldn't have ended this way. But... I'm seeking reconciliation, and, and, and if they don't want it, I'm going to walk on confidence that God's going to turn even that ending into something that he works for my good and for his glory. I hope that's encouraging to you guys in whatever situation you're facing. I know some of it's kind of ethereal, but this is the way God works. This, the pattern is this. It's life, then death, then resurrected life. Spring, and summer, fall, then the death the ending of the year, the death of, this, of everything in, the, in December. But that death is so that you can prune back and then re be restored in resurrection power in a new way. We don't have to fear the endings because God's there from the beginning to the end and he's right there in the between with all of it. So hang on, the story ain't over, but I can guarantee you this. The path of the righteous is like the light of dawn that shines brighter and brighter and brighter. Stay in faith, walk with him, do what's right. And in the end, you're gonna go, ah. Man, God was up to something good when the unveiling comes. You receive that? Let me pray for you. Father, we thank you so much that you are with us, beginning, middle, end, for eternity. I thank you, Lord, you're so big, you can't be contained. And we're forever gonna be growing and going into more of who you are and understanding more and more of who you are. Pray for those this morning that, man, they're in this, right in the middle of a season and going, what, what is this all about? Why did that have to end? And they're hanging on to that old season. And they just need to let it go and trust you. You've brought them to a new season and you're gonna bring them through this. And even if this new season ends, Lord, it's something we don't, it's not something we have to fear. It's part of you growing us into who we want us to be. 
If you're here this morning and you do not have right, your relationship right with Jesus, I'm going to give you a chance to get that right with him. Uh, it starts when you acknowledge your need for him. You cannot do enough good to get to him. So he did the good that you cannot do, and he died in your place. We're going to say a prayer in a second. If you say this prayer and you mean it in your whole heart, God is going to come and forgive your sin. He's going to transfer you out of the kingdom of darkness and set you up with him in the kingdom of light in eternity. It starts when we say this prayer. Let's all say it together. Lord Jesus, we repent of our sin. We turn from our way. We turn to your way. Help us walk in your truth. Amen. Hey, if you just said that prayer, welcome to the kingdom of God. We got some resources for you right under that do it again sign. Don't leave here without checking in with us. We'll give you some resources. You guys can stand. You are dismissed. Uh, go check out that version devotional about this, or you can get the book in the back. You're dismissed. Be blessed. We'll see you next week. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.